Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon, and welcome to the AAPI Communities in Conversation, a series of live online conversations between writers, creators, and librarians that centers Asian American and Pacific Islander voices, books, culture, and experiences. This monthly program is hosted by the University of South Carolina's Augusta Baker Endowed Chair, Publishers Weekly, and Penguin Random House Library Marketing. My name is Elizabeth Joseph, and I'm the Assistant Director of the Nourishal Public Library in New York. Joining me today is Elizabeth Mickey Brenna, the esteemed author of the moving and hauntingly beautiful memoir, Speak Okinawa. Elizabeth is a recipient of the Rona Jaffe Brett Loeb Scholarship and the New York State Summer Writers Institute Scholarship. She earned a BA in English and Philosophy from Northeastern University, MFA in Creative Writing from the University of New Orleans, where she currently lives and teaches. Elizabeth, thank you for joining us today. Our library and publishing colleagues are excited to hear from you. Um, first, can you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to write Speak Okinawa? Oh, um, <laughs> that's, a, uh, oh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big question, right? Because it's um, uh, so much, a lot, uh, my, my whole life. Um, uh, and um, I, mean, I think that the, maybe the more immediate uh, um, inspirations were uh, my mother's baptism and uh, my trip to Japan and or you know more specifically Okinawa but uh, um, my mother uh, she, she was uh, you know 67 years old and you know she was deciding that she was going to get baptized and um, and she went to this church. It was, uh, it's the, called the Rochester Japanese Christian Congregation. And, uh, and I went to her baptism and, um, and it was the first time I've ever seen so many people like my mother in, in one room. Um, and, uh, one of the, one of the astounding things about the congregation is that they're almost all women uh, all the women are around my mother's age and they're all married to, um, uh, American men who had served in the military, uh, white, white American, mostly white American men who had served in the military. So just seeing all these women with this similar situation, uh, it, it, it just for the first time I realized, oh, this is not just me. It's, it, it, this is, this is an isolated incident. This is, isn't just my family. Uh, I always thought we were um, just a, a total anomaly, anomaly alone out there, right? Uh, so that seeing that made me think, uh, want to know how this happened, right? The the history behind it and the just and just the social phenomenon of it. Um, and then also that same year, uh, she was it was. Um, May of 2015 or 2004. Yeah, uh, I think I think that was the year, uh, and then that's when she was baptized. And then that summer, um, I went uh, to Okinawa for the first time in 22 years, and uh, and that was a huge revelation as well. Just uh, um, oh, this is uh, um, I don't know. I just felt like kind of like my genes, half of my genes were activated. You know uh, um, that it's it, uh, um, part of me felt like I'm a, I'm a foreigner here. Uh, uh, and then also part of me had never felt more at home. And so that was a strange feeling to, to grapple with. And, and it was immediately after that I started writing the book. Wow, well, thank you. Um, so let's start and talk a little bit about the narrative. Uh, you chose a really interesting style and voice to tell your story. Can you talk about these choices and why you decided to format your narrative this way? Yeah, it was, um, it kind of couldn't, for me, couldn't have been done any other way. Uh, Cause I, I'm, I'm jumping from, you know, uh, present to past, or at least, you know, the narrative present, uh, uh, which is me as an adult. Uh, and then, um, 
me as a child and then, you know, growing up and then also uh, um, my parents when they were young and Okinawan history. Uh, and it, yeah, because, and I think the more, the older I get, uh, the more I realize how much um, time is not linear, right? It's a, the, the constantly, uh, all of it's, ha- there's, there's so much past in our present. Every time, every time we walk out the door and interact with any human being, it's like our past is, is always there. Uh, and so, um, there, there, it was, it was just so daunting to try to think of all of it, uh, um, at, at, you know, uh, the, the great movie title, like everything, everywhere, all at once. Right. Uh, Um, so I just had to kind of chip away at it and, and fragment it and just be like, okay, I'm just going to talk about this moment and this time right now. And then, uh, um, and I guess thinking about, um, what the reader needed to understand, right. The backstory in order to, in order to really, uh, get the impact of what's happening in this moment. So yeah, it was all just switching around. And I, uh, I don't know, to me, it just didn't seem like there's any other way to tell the story. (laughs) You know, I think you, I think you ended up with a really splendid result. So thank you. (laughs) Thank you. Um, Another aspect of the book, which I also thought was outstanding, was the way you condense centuries of history into these really succinct chapters. So can you tell us a little bit about your research process and and how you came to edit like those millions of pages of history? Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Um, you know, I wish I wish there were millions of pages of history. Uh, um, it was actually very difficult for me when I first wanted to delve into it. Um, it was very difficult for me to find uh, books about Okinawan history that were um, that were written in English, uh, because unfortunately I don't read uh, Japanese, uh, and and also that were that was ri- that were written in English and then not from the Americans' point of view of like how how hard it like it was all about you know all most of them were about the Battle of Okinawa and like how hard it was for America and you know that um, right. what a gruesome battle it was for the for the soldiers of the US soldiers um so that was really difficult i just had uh, um and i i stumbled upon um this book called uh, Okinawa an island people that was actually just the the only book I could find that was Okinawan history until mm-hmm. the Battle of Okinawa. Um, it was 450 pages. Uh, George Kerr, what a, um, a great service I think um, uh, he has done. And and so that so yeah so I started there, <laughs> uh, and then kind of just poked around, kept poking around. Um, there's a great book called uh, Okinawa GI Brides, which is just accounts of uh, nine women and they and who also married, um, you know, U.S. Um, military personnel. So, um, and 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 what their lives were like, and seeing how much it resonated with with my mother's, and and that was more sociological, kind of uh, kind of anthrop- anthropological, um, uh, academic uh, text, but the real what really helped me were the memoirs that I've read and, and to, uh, by uh, survivors kind of, um, and, and memoir, short stories, novellas, like to really get the images and the, um, to really be in the moment. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, girl with the white flag was one of that I read and, uh, princess Lily of the Ryukus, uh, and just seeing, everything just seeing growing up in Okinawa it was both survivors of the battle of Okinawa um and just seeing everything witnessing it right and and uh and this is this is a battle that has uh you know just I, I can't even, like words can't express the impact that it has had on every Okinawan because you know the military bases started after the battle of Okinawa and they're still there and it's such a um uh they're you know the uh, Okinawans are still protesting them so this this battle is so huge uh and and such and it's such a part of who my mother is and a part of um uh who I am through her 
that to read these memoirs and witness it, what was pretty, pretty incredible experience. And it did, it did feel like I um, understood a lot more about myself and, and, and the legacy of it. And um, yeah, I just wanted to, I just wanted to create a story for myself using, using these details that, that, uh, that, you know, that details that I didn't witness firsthand, but, but secondhand um, through the memoir. And I, and I just kind of curated it, uh, um, just pick, you know, picking and choosing uh, and uh, to try and create kind of a, a collective history um, and, you know, give myself that story. Cause it was, cause it was never given to me. Um, I never, um, I didn't know this history until I started writing the book, which was when I was 34 years old. So it's, uh, yeah, uh, it's a long time to live without, without knowing where you come from. So, um, let's talk about names, um, especially since mm -hmm. we both share a first name. Um, I think there were several instances in your book where you talked about kind of the, the reservations that you have about your name. Um, personally, I found this section very poignant and resonated with me because uh, growing up, I had some similar reactions. Um, people said to me, well, you're of Indian descent. Why do you have an Anglo name? And, you know, little did I realize and little did I know that I just couldn't tell them that you're ignorant and there are Christians in the subcontinent. So, um, you know, now that I, I look back and I'm like, oh, I'm glad that I have an Anglo name because it's easy to pronounce. And when my resume is out there, people are not going to reject me. So, um, <laughs> but having said that, you know, our names can be problematic. Can you talk about your name and your first name, your middle name, and its tortured connection to your identity? Yeah, that's so um, that's so relatable. The 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 right the the expectations people have based on your name, uh, and the kind of weird when you know when they finally meet you and see your face, the weird sort of uh, um, disappointment, uh, discomfort that like that I feel responsible for navigating. Right, like just like oh, like so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry uh um so it's just and and having to deal with that your whole life right of, of uh oh like you know I have to I have to do this again um yeah kind of just like uh it's just this slow burn of of uh of I don't know I don't know what the feeling is it's just this uh, um yeah this this feeling of like minimizing their uh, discomfort and, and also, um, uh, kind of normalizing their ignorance as, as you're saying. And, uh, so that, that, so that was a big part of my first name as well. Just, just that reaction every time. Um, and then also, um, and my, my mother, because my father chose the name and, uh, and because he, he's, uh, he's from, uh, he he has uh, Anglo uh, um, heritage, right? It, um, uh, Irish, Irish, English, Irish, Scotch, and Italian um, as the other half. But he 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 named me after his mother, and um, and my mother, right? She, I, I don't even want to say that she mispronounced it. She just pronounced it differently, right? And then and. Um, uh, cause Elizabeth, like everyone's, you know, how, how I hear Elizabeth, everyone else say Elizabeth. And then how I hear her say Elizabeth, it, it, you know, it was constantly, um, uh, I could hear the difference. And even, even when I wasn't aware of it as a child and it just, and I, and it really, um, I think in a way distanced me from her, even j just that th these first early experiences of your name and being addressed uh, uh, and, and then hearing how she's addressing me and it's, it's, uh, uh, um, it just othered her. Um, uh, um, just one more thing that othered her to me. Uh, and, and then, yeah, it wasn't until a very long time where it just, it, I don't know, just, it, it, it's just the way she says it. And I love the way that she says it. And it's also kind of um, um, ours, 
you know, and, 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 you know, I've got, as we got older, it was actually the way that she pronounced it sort of reinforced a bond mm. uh, um, between us, right? Because it's just like, yes. every, yeah, everyone else is different, but this is the way right. you say yes. it. And, it's yeah. like a very private thing between the two of you. Yeah. 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 And, and so that, and so that, so now, yeah, it feels good. And, and, you know, I've come, I've kind of, I've come to terms with uh, having my first name and, and not, and not worrying about people being surprised when, <laughs> when they see my face after hearing my name. Uh, and, uh, and Miki has a interesting, you know, a fraught connection too to my identity because it's my, it's my middle name is Japanese middle name. And, um, it's uh, it has so many different meanings that I you know wasn't aware of until I actually bothered to look it up. But uh, um, one of the meanings is beautiful princess, and you know that's that was the whole idea about um, you know my my father marrying my mother, my mother coming here. It's just like oh you know uh, um, uh, we're kind of gonna we're gonna right the wrongs of the past, right? Just the, 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 this princess uh, um, and and give her everything that we didn't have. Um, and then and then uh, as I got older too, because I'm uh, you know eight, half Asian, uh, uh, the I, it just sort of became a symbol of how um, I was exoticized and fetishized. Like um, only only men would call me Miki, you know. And then uh, um, uh, uh, and you know they it was it was kind of intrusive the way you know. Um, that it's just it was just a claiming, right? It was just like oh, like your middle name's Miki, like you're Asian. Let me call you Miki, and it's like oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, and so it's just this, uh, another way that our, I don't know what, I, I don't know how, what, what the term is, I guess another way that our, our, um, our culture our is kind of, it represented to me another way that our culture is like still for them, you know, like as, as like, mm -hmm. as kind of this entertainment and like, oh, like, uh, um, something to gawk at. And, right. you know, uh, yeah. Um, so that's another name too, that I had to kind of make mine again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, a central aspect of being an immigrant or children of immigrants is identity, right? This book to me is just as much about your mother's identity as it is about yours. Um, can you talk about how identity acceptance and struggle to reconcile our own ethnicity with being American, shape how we live and operate in this country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a uh, um, that's a loaded question. That's so yeah, it's a loaded question, and it's, and it's hard because it's like uh, um, America, right? The uh, how it's so it's so intricate and complicated um, being American, and and I think it it um, or being any of any nationality. Um, and I don't know what it's like to be any other nationality. Uh, um, I don't know, it just makes me think of so many things. And I think of how, you know, we, America, you know, seem, seems to be about like, it's just, uh, it's founded on like who is and who isn't, right? And, right. And uh, um, and we have this great like marketing propaganda scheme of diversity, you know, or uh, um, that, that that's one of the characteristics of a, of America, right? It's like we're so diverse, um, you know. Come join us, melting pot. Uh, yes, and, but there are certain things that are so yes. distinct about being American, right? And mm -hmm. you know, the whole like blue jeans, and, you know, sort of yeah. Like, and right, stereotypes about what it's like to be American or American is rebellious, dominant yeah. culture. Right. right. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Just how it, uh, and 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 what a weird. Uh, I just don't know what it would be to grow up any other way. Like I don't think we can avoid it. Uh, um, that kind of smog of um, dominance and, and and superiority of just like being American and just. How, you know, and taking over the whole world and feeling it, it reminds me a lot of the, um, 
uh, Stranger in a Village by James Baldwin and and how uh, like talking about the white people in the Swiss village, how they can't be a stranger anywhere in the world, even though they've never left, they've never left their Swiss village. They're so isolated, but everywhere they go, they belong. Uh, and, and that's, and that's kind of, uh, you know, um, be, because, because of, uh, um, you know, America, <laughs> there's so many things I want to say about this question. Uh, and, and yeah, and, and it's, 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 uh, it's, a farce, right? And and I think and I think I'm, I'm, I'm a lot of immigrants come here thinking that, uh, you know, but bu- like buying into the advertisement, right? Of, of that it's a it's a democracy and and status is based on merit. Uh, I know I, I know that my mother, uh, I think you know, is one of the reasons why she came here. Just and all that glint, you know, that that just. Oh, the, the the excitement of it, um, yeah. Elvis, Disney World, yeah, right? Yeah, uh, um, right. gold and land of milk and honey. Yeah, and then just the total letdown uh, of that we're so that we're um, not. I don't know it, that it's very hierarchical, right? And then and that uh, and you have to um, you kind of I don't know you have to. Uh, um, it's, it's, it's hierarchical. It's, 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 it's based on white supremacy. Everyone is just trying to get us right. Close to, uh, um, close to being whatever that label means, right. Uh, um, white as possible. Uh, and, and yeah, it's, it's, a um, it's a battle, right. It's a, it's, it, I, I don't know. Cause I don't know what it's like to grow up in other countries. And I, so I can't say that it's better or worse anywhere else. Right. Uh, but, um, that's something that I always am really heartbroken for, for my mother. Cause just, she's, uh, um, and you know, I don't, I don't want to be condescending. She, she, you know, she, uh, she had her life. Um, but it's just so much, of why she came here was based on a lie and uh um yeah and that and that is painful to reckon with Mm. um carla cornejo via vicencio author of undocumented americans and a new yorker piece talked about sacrifices immigrant parents make for their children on that same token children also give up so much to be assimilated and model Americans. Um, I read that frequently in your story, and especially your mother's story. Can you talk about the costs and burdens as a child in your mother's immigrant story? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I think one of them is, you know, you give up, uh, like for, for my mother, right? She gave up her culture. She gave up her nativeness and her community um and and was for the most part very isolated and um and then for for me right you don't uh just growing up and not understanding why uh as as a young child not really understanding why my mother was so different from everybody else why I was so different from everyone else um not and 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 the assumption right we go to school and we learn all the subjects and and you know it's all told from uh basically like a white american's perspective right like you're 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 euro-american um and and this is the history that we learn and and me just being like but i'm not this doesn't mm." (laughs) <laughs> uh, and, and, and really not getting that. And my mother not, and, and not understanding how my, my mother fits into that picture. Like there's, uh, um, no, um, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't know anything about Okinawan history, how, um, and my mother couldn't tell me not just because of her, um, the language barrier, but also because of this, uh, this internalized inferiority this um, uh, sense of urgency to assimilate and to deny that, 
And then she, she really never thought it was important either. It's like, ah, you don't need mm-hmm. to know that. You just, you know, you're like, yeah, uh, just grow up, just go to school, uh, um, learn these things that everyone else is learning. Like, I want you to be like everyone else. So that, so there's that pressure too, from the, from the immigrant parent. Um, and, and just not <laughs> kind of both of us denying that that's impossible. Right. Uh, um, and, uh, yeah, I, um, I think of so much that my mother sacrificed and also while she was here too, she, uh, spoiled us rotten. Like I'm talking about, um, uh, me and my father, like she, uh, she worked, she worked all day at the restaurant and then came home and did all the chores and cooked and and it was you know a, a, uh, for for love but also because I think it was also this this kind of like this is my rightful place like ma- you know making making sure making sure I take care of them right mm-hmm. uh, um and then as a child expecting that and just thinking that's the way it is and then growing up and feeling all the guilt for, you know, for perpetuating, for perpetuating it. And, and, uh, um, so yeah, that's still, that's still something that I, uh, gosh, I think about and struggle with every day. It's just like how, how much of a burden we put on her. Um, yeah. And that for so long, for so much of my life, I didn't appreciate it, you know, and I think it would have, it would have made, it would have been a lot better if I was, um, more grateful as a child and, you know, and more respectful. So but. hindsight is 20, 20. Isn't of it? course. Yeah, yeah. Ex- um, <laughs> exactly. So um, another theme familiar to us in the AAPI community is the dichotomy of being both visible and invisible. Um, you talked about feeling this way in very instances in your life, but um, you had an epiphany when you got to Oakland. Um, you said you were finally visible and not exposed, which I think is interesting usage of the word visible and exposed there. Um, can you talk about that moment in Oakland and um, talk about like, how do you come to terms with the, the predicament of this duality of being both seen and unseen? Mm-hmm. Um, well, I, uh, you know, the, the, yeah, I talk about in my book, how I grew up, I grew up in, you know, uh, Fairport, New York, which at the time was 99% white and then 1% everything else. And then the 1%, we just wanted to stay as far away from each other as possible. Just, yeah, I think I, because like, uh, kind of like, so that we weren't so exposed, you know, uh, um, and then when I went to college, I, um, it was mostly, I, cause I, you just, you just gravitate toward what you're familiar with. I went to college in Boston, uh, um, which is theoretically is more diverse than Fairport, New York, but it's, <laughs> it can be, it, in my experience, it was very segregated. Right. And I, and, and I, and I hung out with, uh, again, a bunch of other people that didn't look like me. Um, and so the first, and the first time I really was a, around people of color was Oakland. And, um, and yeah, and the, the, you know, the, the, the stock questions, um, you know, where are you from? <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, and, 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 and any other questions that people may have about my ethnicity, it's so much different from a person who understands and appreciates than from a person who has no idea what you're going through, right? And it, it, who's ignorant, right? There's a, just is a totally different connotation and and feeling behind it uh, that that I didn't know existed until right until and, until I was actually talking with um, like f- fellow members of my of my community, right? Uh, so so that felt uh, that felt it was uh, great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I miss it. I still miss it. I, uh, um, yeah, I, I have a, a lot of love in my heart for Oakland, uh, for that reason. Um, 
and yeah, I don't know in terms of, I guess now that I know that there's a difference, right? The, the, the visibility and exposure, um, I, uh, yeah, I don't, like, I, I always felt like sometimes with, with, you know, um, people who are outsiders, uh, for lack of a better term, you know, asking these questions, like, where are you from? Do Japanese people do this? Do they do this? Like, uh, it, <laughs> um, uh, uh, did you have, you know, did you, I remember one, you know, question, uh, it was like, you know, uh, did you face a lot of discrimination when you're growing up? It was like at a dinner party or it reminded me of a get out. Uh, that, <laughs> that, you know, I remember seeing that that scene, and I was like, "Oh my goodness!" <laughs> like that is uh, that's so real. Um, uh, so, it, and it's kind of this pressure to do the song and dance. I'm like, "Okay, I will. <laughs> I'll be the. Uh, I'll be your representative." Uh, and so, I guess now knowing the difference is just not feeling that pressure obligation anymore is just like no I don't have to I don't have to answer any questions like you know uh, um, um I don't yeah I don't have to be this for you and and not so but uh, you know uh, while while trying not to be rude mm -hmm. <laughs> or maybe minding less about being rude I don't know I think it just I think it's just a, the biggest deal uh um is uh in terms of just trying to manage uh, um, uh, these two kind of approaches um, or, or, or states of being, right, uh, visible and exposure. It's just really just knowing the difference and be like, ah, that's what that is. Oh, and this, what, this is what this is. And I want more of that. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, trauma and resilience, I think, are, are two overpowering themes throughout, this, throughout your, your memoir. Given yours and your mother's personal and generational trauma, um, I think that you know it's you have you both have really embodied like these themes of trauma and resilience. Um, but even in in the chapter around apology, that chapter on apology, I, I think that to me you were saying that it's it's time to like let go of the past, to like heal and like sort of because holding on is just going to generate more pain so I think you know we need to to let go in order to heal so can you what have you learned about ending the cycle of inherited trauma and what advice do you have for for kids of this generation and the next generation yeah I mean that's interesting I because um, I, I know what you mean by letting go, but I'm not sure I want to, I, I, meant, I meant to let go of the past. Because I think that letting go of the past is actually impossible. <laughs> and also a privilege. I think that that's right. something, you know, uh, um, uh, that, 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 that's something that was put, put on a lot of people and it favored, it, it favored people who didn't want to confront their past, right? Uh, um, it's just like, you know, we're, oh, we're born, we're a blank slate, and here we are, we've, you know, uh, um, um, nothing happened before us, it doesn't matter, like, you, you know, you are, you are who you are, and, and just your, your actions, and your merit, and your choices, and that is so not true, right? We don't, we all arrive um, with so much that came before us that is determining uh, how, how we're going to be in this world. Uh, so I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't think we can let go of the past. I don't think you, anyone should let go of the past, like either, you know, uh, conquerors or conquered, right. Or, uh, um, uh, oppressors and oppressed, like they both need to confront it. Um, and I think it's really, uh, <sighs> Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's more, um, it's painful. Right. And, 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 and it, uh, um, I think that's why I denied it for so long. Cause it's just like, this is going to be hard. 
uh, um, and avoided it. But then I now now that I I have confronted it, I feel um, like it was so much more painful before, right? And I think I think I think knowing I think knowing is better than than obviously it's, it, than than not knowing. You can't because you can't escape it. You can't escape it. So um, right. so I would say I would say that I. It's impossible to let go of the past, but I'm not sure what we're letting go of. I don't know. Maybe, maybe letting go of um, like blame and shame, right? The self-loathing about, you know, like it's not, yeah. And, and maybe um, the, the personal responsibility for things that we shouldn't feel personally responsible for, right? That, had, right? Um, that weren't our fault. Uh, and then, but also on the same token, being accountable for, for what, what it, what you did do and, and had control over. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that like, in, I mean, especially with, well, in your mother's case, just, um, just the, the trauma of her family and all the inherited trauma yeah. and, you know, mm -hmm. it's at some point you yeah. just can't be imprisoned or shackled by it, right? You have to. I don't know, okay. find find a way to move forward. And yeah, absolutely. Like and and just to, and just to acknowledge that it wasn't her fault. Um, none of it was her fault. Right. That was so. Uh, that's what was so uh, powerful about learning the history. Right. Uh, um, because before, but not knowing anything about where she came from, and just to edit, like you know, just not understanding her isolation, not understanding um, her, her sadness and just, uh, um, and her coping mechanism with uh, alcohol. And, right. and, 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 it, and, it, and I was just, it was always just her fault, her fault, her fault until as I like, know this is, this has been a long time, you know what I mean? She, she, uh, um, she's just the result of all of this. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. Um, so I saw your trip to Japan as a sort of home going. Um, can you talk about that trip and what it meant to you and what it meant to your family? Mm -hmm. That, yeah, that was a, um, it was an amazing, amazing, amazing experience. I, uh, um, I, I, uh, I think one of the most, one of the most special things was, I guess it, it was the welcoming and the acceptance I felt from people who had didn't know me. It's like, oh, this this is family. I don't know. It's something about the, I think something about the island culture and also just it. it, it um, there, I don't know. I've never experienced that before. Where like blood and family really meant something I think I think we're uh we're we're so upset in America we're so obsessed with like nuclear <laughs> nuclear and immediate mm -hmm. uh um that and and we don't understand like we, we don't it's not enough uh, um just think thinking about our ancestors and thinking you know thinking and thinking about how like that we're uh this, this extended family a tribe right and I felt that I felt that so much um um, meeting all my cousins and my aunts and uncles and, and, uh, um, it was wonderful. And then also just seeing my mother, um, like thrive and be the, the center of attention and the spotlight and being the expert, you know, she was always mm -hmm. the one being like, you know, ask your father, ask your father, your father knows, your father knows. And, finally like being in Amer in Okinawa and it's hers and she, you know what I mean and she's the one that leads and we follow her and she's translating for us and um I mean I, you know I'm sure after a while I'm sure it was uh, really annoying and exhausting to translate for us <laughs> um and that's some, that's something else the, the guilt too is just like that burn in and of um, her constantly having to switch back and forth between um, her two cultures, uh, you know, Jap Japanese, Okinawan and American, but it's in her language too, Japanese and English. Um, incidentally, I always, I think it's very interesting too, how different 
Okinawa. That, that's something I learned that my mother is not Japanese, is that she is Okinawan. And when we went, when we were in the mainland, um, it, it just ha- how much I've always clumped those together. And mm-hmm. it's it's it, it's not um, I don't know it's, it's it's generalizing and 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 what's I don't know. Uh, um, but when we were in the mainland, she was uh, um, like she couldn't understand Japanese, the Japanese they spoke in Japan mm-hmm. and people couldn't really understand her. So it's different. It's different. And, and also being so proud of that, um, that it's, uh, how much, how much itself Okinawan is, uh, and, and how distinct. And again, we come, we're, uh, coming from America, right. Where it's all about assimilation and, and it's, and it's melting pot to this, like, you know, so-called, but so that we kind of just don't know anymore, <laughs> like who is and who isn't and yet we're always obsessed with it and then going to a place that just is right Mm -hmm. uh um is uh oh as i don't know yeah and and and, um i wish you could go back uh um, many times a year but it's very far away (laughs) yeah that was that was i think that was a wonderful (laughs) chapter and almost towards the end of the book and i i liked how you kind of just oppose like your experiences with like the memories of your father, right? So you had that mm-hmm. 1974. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I thought that was really, that was really amazing. Thank you Thank for that. You. Um, while this memoir is so much about being Okinawan, um, you also delve into the other half of your ethnicity. Can you talk about being biracial and what it means to be and not to be a member of like, the privilege slash dominant class of people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's something else I'm still, uh, you know, constantly figuring out and navigating. And um, I don't know. I, I think there's uh, I think what I'm trying to do, I think is that my best way to uh um embrace the biracial identity is try trying to be more of an ally to um to to people of color to people who are um I don't know I guess um less privileged right um because 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 I you know have kind of that in and out and and also understanding uh right like to, uh, um struggling with my own white tendencies right this this kind of the the uh and and and, and I have I I get self-conscious still every time I say white um because what does that mean but I don't you know uh um and I, you know I, th- I think of it more right I, uh, um I, I one of these days I'll really think get down to it and like write out like what exactly do I mean by this but 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 just this I I still have you know I have a um a sense of entitlement and this sense of entitlement also seems to use try to use my half Asian-ness to my advantage a lot right like uh um like it's it's still it's this weird split self of just like I uh still my half Asian-ness is for my whiteness you know and I have to like I have to, I have to think about that all the time and just to be like, okay, and just try to manage it. And, um, uh, and then when, you know, when I do come across other people of color, it's like, I, I want to kind of use that in and out knowledge, right. To be, I don't know, just to be better, uh, um, better service. I don't know. (laughs) Um, yeah. Um, in reading your book, I, I see that you bear it so much of like your soul, right? You, you bear it so much of your soul and expose so many of your, your frailties and fragilities. Did you have any second thoughts once the, the book was out there and published? Did you find it to be a cathartic experience, a therapeutic experience? What did you hope to, to gain from sharing your story? Mm-hmm. I mean, I had to 
for a long time, it was just, I, I had to write it. Like it was, uh, um, I, I couldn't not write it. It was, it, it, it was just, I don't know. It was, it, people use the analogy of like, uh, being pregnant or right. It was just like, I like the, the this is the story is inside of me and, uh, I need, like, I need to get it out. Uh, just, just to make sense, just, just to see it out there in the world. And then, but I didn't know what the reach would be, right? It was like, as I was writing it, it was like, I'm writing this just to get it out of my head uh, uh, onto a piece of paper. Uh, and that was very, I wouldn't say it was easy to do, but it had to be done. It was just it, like, it, it was just compulsive, right? And then once it was, I, I you know, was like, oh, this is going to be published. <laughs> uh, um, and lots of people, my family will read it. My friends will read it. Um, but, you know, the, the um, uh, public. Uh, I had very much, uh, I, 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 it's not like I didn't want it to be published, but I was terrified. You know, I was very, very just, um, well, now, well, now I've kind of, I've completely lost control. Right. That's, that's, what, what? How are they going to receive it? Who's going to re who's going to receive it? And how are they going to receive it? Uh, um, it was so scary. And I, you know, lots, of, lots of sleepless nights, um, lots of waking up in the middle of the night uh, in a panic. I was very, very anxious about it. Um, and then it was fine. <laughs> <laughs> it was it it, it 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 felt wonderful um it was I, I think it was a catharsis and um and just having so many people reach out to me uh the, pe the people I knew uh that was because I, I experienced so much of this alone like to in to total privacy I never talked to anyone about it um and so to have just people that I kn knew knew know right? Uh, this is, this is, this is what's going on. Uh, um, this whole time I've known you <laughs> and, uh, was a wonderful release. And then also from, uh, strangers too, who were either, um, biracial, uh, um, so many people who are, uh, half Okinawan, um, reached out to me, uh, or, or, you know, or, or anyone who could relate to the story and, and how many, and, and, and they kept, and, and they were always, there was reaching out to me and saying, thank you for, for writing the book. But, um, but, you know, cause it made me feel less alone. And, and I was like, you're making me feel less alone. Like just, just that feedback of that, that kind of mirroring, like, you know, like, yeah, um, uh, you, you exist what you went through exists and uh I went through it too it's just it's incredible it's, it's, it's like it's like that visibility right uh that visibility and voice and and uh how important that is with um healing trauma um yeah um thank you and our last question comes from the audience okay which is, what's what's next for you there another uh, yeah I mean works. uh li life life is still happening and um I'm still figuring myself out you know and that and I do that through writing so um I uh I'm working on a um it's still such a baby it's like a little yeah like not not even a baby right uh um uh it's a concept <laughs> uh but I'm I'm, st I'm starting to write uh think about writing, get, generating some material for a second memoir. And, um, and yeah, just because that's, I don't know, I guess that's how I get to know myself and discover myself. So um, hopefully there's, there's some of that. There's hopefully that's next. No, <laughs> hopefully. No, no. Thank you for taking us on the, the journey with you. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you for coming along. <laughs> So thank you, Elizabeth, for spending this time with us. Um, we also want to thank our host, Dr. Nicole Cook, the University of South Carolina's Augusta Baker Endowed Chair, Publishers Weekly, and Penguin Random House Library Marketing. 
And a very special thank you to our audience for joining us this afternoon yeah. and for your support of this inaugural series. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for future viewing. Thanks and have a great day.